Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation, A Leader's Dilemma, How to Effectively Deal with Paradox, presented by Professor Peter Topping of the Gozueta Business School at Emory University. My name is Neo Tabenciential here at IB Exec, and I'll be helping to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I just want to cover a very quick uh, few housekeeping items for the audience. First, all attendees are currently in listen-only mode. However, we do encourage you to participate in the session today by asking questions to the presenter. And actually, feel free to ask these questions as the uh, presentation progresses, and we'll field them as they are relevant to the slide or the topic uh, at hand. Uh, you can do so using the GoToWebinar control panel located on either the left or right-hand side of your screen. And there's a questions or, or chat box you can use to type in your, uh, your questions. Uh, additionally, we shall be recording today's session, so you can look forward to receiving a copy of the recording via email in the coming days. And now I'd like to officially introduce today's presenter. Uh, professor Peter Topping is an associate professor in the practice of organization and management at the Goizueta Business School. In this role, he teaches courses in leadership, organizational behavior, and ethics across the school's MBA programs. Outside the classroom, Professor Topping is an active consultant and executive coach, specializing in organizational effectiveness, talent management, leadership development, and senior team effectiveness. He's also worked with a number of major corporations in designing and delivering executive development programs. Some of his current and past clients include Coca-Cola, Eastern Chemical, The Home Depot, IBM, Intercontinental Hotels, Lockheed Martin, and the Mayo Clinic, to name a few. And with that, I'll transition over to Peter to take it away. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. A couple of days ago, uh, a former colleague and friend of mine, Dennis, kind of popped in. He'd been retired for a while, so I hadn't seen him. And the irony of it is that he really started me thinking about this topic in a structured way. Uh, we worked together back oh, a decade or so ago, doing, developing, designing executive programs for companies, customized programs through Goizueta's Executive Education Unit. And one day, Dennis came up to me, I think it was around 2000, 2001, and he said, Peter, I've got a book. You've got to read it. It's going to help so much with the work we're doing. Now, you could tell Dennis is an enthusiastic fellow. He still is in his middle 70s, I'm pleased to say. I'm a little more muted in my approach. So I said, thank you, Dennis. I appreciate it. I'll certainly read it. And I added that book to my stack of books. It was uh, Polarity Management by Barry Johnson. Fortunately, it was a relatively thin paperback, but it was one of those books you know, I'll get to eventually. In addition to being an enthusiast, Dennis is a bit of a persistent fellow. So every couple of days, he would say, Peter, have you read the book? Have you read the book? So finally, I decided the only way to stop this was to read the book. And of course, as I realize it now, I should have looked at it right away, because it really did provide a way of thinking that I hadn't captured before. I'd, had these concepts in my head, but I wasn't clear on how to put them together. And that book really helped. And we'll get to that book in a minute. But the point is, what is paradox and why is it a leadership concern? Now, since those years back 15, 16 years ago, working with a lot of different companies and clients over the years and thinking about this, uh, I think I've refined a little bit of my thinking. I still feel very strongly about it, as you can probably tell. Uh, and there have been other books and other articles written about it, some of which we'll talk about today. But let's start with kind of a basic definition of what we mean by paradox. And so, of course, I went to the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia, to look up some of the definitions they have about what paradox means, as you can see on the screen. It involves some type of contradiction, something that is interrelated, but the two topics are somewhat at odds with each other. And in common usage, the word paradox often refers to something that is <clears throat> both right and both wrong at the same time. And so how does that apply to organizations? Let me share with you a couple of what I think are examples of organizational paradoxes I have witnessed over the years. See if any of these relate to your organization. First and foremost, public companies are assessed by analysts and others on two very important criteria, how well and how fast they're growing and how predictable they are <clears throat> in assessing their earnings for the quarter. Well, how predictable is growth, folks? Those are two items that are paradoxical and they certainly challenge the leaders of public organizations to figure out how to grow and be predictable at the same time. 
which relates to quarterly earnings and long-term strategy. We can make decisions now that boost our earnings, but they may hurt us in the long run. However, if we focused entirely on the long run and our future, we may not hit our quarterly earnings, which makes us unpredictable. So we're gonna get dinged for that. We have to find a way to manage those two paradoxical comments. In the world of marketing and operations, there's clearly a paradox. I haven't met a salesperson yet who doesn't love every customer they bump into. And we'll bring back to the organization, hey, here's what the customer wants, here's what I told them we would do. Then the operations folks or the manufacturing people say, what are you nuts? We can't make that or that's not uh, profitable for us to do. So there's tension between marketing and operations, of course. And then one we're running into a lot today, certainly with IT firms. Um, how do you manage your quality of your product and hit the window of opportunity to get to market? And the engineers fight and struggle for the highest quality and the marketing folks want it out. 80% uh, decent is okay for now as long as we can fix it on the fly and we'll do the updates. So there's tension between quality and speed to market. <clears throat> Companies are getting very heavy into process-driven approaches to maintain consistency and standardization. And yet you have to have some flexibility in order to adapt to situations as they arise. And then the one that I talk the most about in my own classes here at Goizueta, which are leadership classes, is that you're not either a manager or a leader, you're both a manager and a leader. And at times those two things can be at odds with each other. You may need to be more manager than leader at one point when you're missing deadlines, not getting results. And there are times when you need to be a little more leader than manager, when you need to develop your talent and make sure that you're recruiting and retaining the best people. There's some tension between those two, and these are paradoxes that all of us face in organizational world. So what does that mean for the leader? Well, I've done a few sessions where Tom Peters has spoken to organizations, and uh, he's a little irascible, and he would say, deal with it. Yes, things are inconsistent. Yes, they're contradictions. We have to find a way to manage it. And that's more or less what we try to talk about here, both in our executive MBA and executive education programs to help our clients understand the importance of paradox. To kind of make the point, let me start with this, uh, this slide. It's uh, Olympic season, as you know, we'll be starting the winter games fairly soon in South Korea. And this is a slide from the summer games. These are the winners in the <clears throat> high jump in the 20th century. So these, each red dot represents a gold medal winning jump. Uh, the, the vertical axis has meters, that's why the numbers are relatively low. But you can see, at the beginning of the century, scissors was the technique used. And then eventually, a new technique was introduced, the Western roll. Straddle was the, introduced in the 50s, and the gold medal winner didn't jump quite as high with that technique as the previous gold medal winner using the Western roll. But straddle was clearly a superior technique because it has the steepest slope of any of these. And then in the 1964 games in Mexico City, Dick Fosbury introduced what we now still call the Fosbury flop. I remember being a kid watching him and uh, he was the first, I think, nerdy looking athlete I can recall. We thought maybe he'd landed on his head a few times too many. But clearly it was a great technique and it's still one used today. In fact, if this is a trend line, perhaps what we should see very soon in a Summer Olympic is a new technique. There are more gold medal winners with the Fosbury flop than any other. So unless we have hit the peak of human capability, I suspect somewhere soon we'll be seeing a new technique. Well, you might thank me for this Olympic moment, but what does this have to do with the organizational world? I think the metaphor is really not that far afield at all. In the world of strategy, when you roll out a new strategy, of course, it's very hard to keep it invisible today. If it appears to be working, your competitors are going to copy it, they're going to adapt it, they're going to improve it until the next innovation comes, the next new strategy, the next technological breakthrough. And so as we see in the high jump techniques here, Different competitors adopted the technique, improved it until a new one um, was offered 
and it seemed to be superior. So the competitors moved to that one. Which means that when you're rolling out a new strategy, it immediately begins to decay. You have to be aware that while you're executing on the new strategy, which you really have to do well, you also have to be developing the next strategy because competition will be copying what you do and it'll be time for you to do something slightly different because the goal of strategy is differentiation. A friend of mine is a strategy professor at Dartmouth Tuck School of Business, VJ Govindarajan, and to make it easy for us Anglos, he says, call him VJ. So I'll, refu uh, I'll refer to him as VJ. And uh, VG is one of the uh, most known business gurus these days. Um, look up some of his writings on innovation. I think you'll find them very interesting. And the reason I know that he's uh, cited as a guru is because anytime some media uh, lists him on their top list of gurus, he sends me a clipping. So I have a little file of VG clippings. And he has a, a, a simple, but I think a profound model of looking at what we just talked about. And he calls it box one, box two, and box three thinking. And box one is operations, execution, managing the present. And we need to do that as effectively as possible. And it clearly is a distinguishing characteristic among firms in the same industry. Those who execute at the highest level win over the long term. BG would say that boxes two and three are strategy. In fact, sometimes box two is the more onerous one. Letting go of things that have helped you get where you are today is sometimes more difficult than coming up with new ideas. But the two of them together make strategy. Now, what does that have to do with paradox? Well, hang on. I'll try to show you as VG looks at what box one and boxes two and three are like. He tries to drill it down into sets of behaviors and things that one has to do to be effective in both of those boxes. If you notice, looking at boxes one, boxes two and three, reading across the screen, you see contradictions, opposites, benchmarking best practices, creating next practices. Well, clearly we should benchmark best practices. We learn what somebody else is doing better today than we're doing it. Let's find out what they're doing. We'll adapt it to our situation it'll improve our performance today. Good idea. But the goal of strategy, remember, is to be different. So if you're copying your competitors, how are you differentiating yourself? That's why BG says you also have to create next practices, doing things that nobody else does to continue to be different from your competitors. And as you work your way down that list, you'll notice that most of these are at odds with each other. Centralized resource allocation is classic. The senior team is gonna be making the decisions about how do we allocate the resources, human capital, financial capital that we have in order to meet our needs for the coming year. You can't do everything you wanna do. And they're the ones who have to make those tough decisions. Well, how does that kind of connote with um, innovation? Because what happens in a centralized resource allocation process is I'm developing my budget for the year, I'm gonna present it to the senior team and I'm gonna put in some innovations, some new ideas. And that's gonna be the first thing they're gonna cut because they're gonna say, you know what, Peter, it's a great idea. We don't have the resources to do it this year. Maybe we'll try it again in the future. And yet all organizations have to be innovative. So what VG is arguing is that in addition to the centralized resource allocation that you need to be efficient in managing the present, we also need to be funding and feeding some of our new ideas. And he considers it a decentralized resource allocation. Set up a venture capital fund, an R&D budget in the organization using different metrics, perhaps with different people making those decisions. The reason I'm bringing this up with paradox is if you look at these box one, boxes two and three, if you're a black and white thinker, this does not compute. We either do one or the other, but how do I figure out how to do both? And, and I've often heard from organizations that, you know, the senior team is too tactical, too operational, or they're not strategic enough, or these guys are too visionary, they're way in the clouds, they need to get down into the operational world. 
what I think we're referring to most of the time is that it's hard to be in both spaces simultaneously. That there's a real interest, if you will, in focusing on one side or the other. And the need to kind of do both requires a different way of thinking. And this was written about very nicely by Roger Martin, Harvard Business Review in June of 2007. It's entitled, his article was, How Successful Leaders Think. And, and this, with the book that Dennis gave me, uh, really helped kind of shape my thinking about this. Roger Martin has gone on to write a book called The Opposable Mind. It was published a few years ago. I'd recommend it to you if you like the concept. And if you notice in this quote that I have, is we should be examining, he says, how leaders think. Now, leadership is a cognitive process, a behavioral process, emotional, relational. So there are multiple dimensions to leadership, and we talk about all those here. But the cognitive part is an important one. How do you think like a leader? And he said, we need to be able to build on the tensions among conflicting ideas. And he distinguished between conventional and integrative thinking. And just to quickly go through this in summary of that article, <clears throat> in conventional thinking, you focus on a few relevant features and you get honed in on those. Integrative thinking, you look at some that are maybe not quite so obvious, but are somehow related, and we need to draw the relationships between them. In conventional thinking, it's very one way, a linear. We are taking our steps through the process. In an integrative way, we're looking at it multidirectional, it goes back and forth. We break problems down into discrete chunks and then solve each chunk conventionally. In an integrative approach, you've got to see it as a system, look at it as a whole, and then decide how to move forward given the system's reactions. And conventional thinking is all about either or options. We either do this or that. In an integrative thinking, you're not able to choose one or the other but how do we resolve the tension among these opposing ideas? Predictability and growth, for example. So he goes on to write more about it. I'm not gonna read this slide to you, you'll have it. But the point is he likens it to us being, you know, distinguishing human beings from other primates of having that opposable thumb, where you can hold two things in your hand at the same time. <clears throat> and we use that to manage many things in our world. Well, what if we could do that in our heads? What if we could hold two opposing ideas in our head at the same time, realizing both were right and both were wrong, and it's okay. It's effectively dealing with cognitive dissonance and studying that in psychology years ago. And he says the, one of the important reasons for that is that we have a tendency as humans to try to understand our complex world by oversimplifying situations and trying then to be certain about it. And certainly we see that a lot in our political environment today. You're either on one side or the other. Your eyes are for this or you're for that. And really the way it stands is you're either with me or against me. And we have too many complex issues for us to be choosing either or. And so one of the things we have to do is try to figure out how to manage the tension among these. F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote about this some decades ago, that he thought that was a sign of a truly intelligent person, that you could hold those two opposing ideas in your head at the same time. So this takes me back to Dennis's book, Polarity Management by Barry Johnson. And in that book, he distinguishes between problem solving and managing polarities. And he says the important thing is to be able to balance that tension among these competing ideas. And the point is to be a both and rather than an either or thinker. Now, there are times when either or is appropriate. There are problems that need to be solved. The assumption is with a problem that there is a solution. There's an end point. And we do the best we can to analyze that problem, come up with our alternatives, and choose the best option. Hiring decisions, for example, classic either or. It's a problem to be solved. Whether you build or buy, kind of as you're growing a growth strategy for your business, you would want an either or option. But Johnson was applying, you know, there are many things we have to deal with as leaders that have no endpoint. 
there's not a solution. And it's a matter of managing both of them and trying to think about how to do both of them. It gives the example of stability and change. We'll talk more about that in a minute. When I teach this topic to folks, I usually bring in kind of a personal example. Um, I've raised five teenagers in my parental career. Um, some of you may have raised teenagers or currently are, or certainly you all were teenagers, so you might be able to identify with this. A paradox among many of dealing with adolescence is you want your child to grow up to be an independent thinker, to be able to take care of themselves, enter the adult world, and maybe eventually send money home. Well, maybe. At the same time, you want them to be safe, not kill themselves or anybody else. Well, if you think about those two things, independence on one hand, safety on the other, they're interdependent. The more freedom you give a teenager, the higher the risk. The more you control the teenager, the less independent they might be. If you think about it, you might even be able to map it. Doesn't matter which one you put on which pole, here's a polarity map Barry Johnson talks about. So independence might be on our left pole, safety on our right pole. There are benefits to each. Obviously, teach your child to be independent, they take care of themselves, they become contributing adults. The benefit of safety is they live to be an adult. And then there are the negative consequences if you overemphasize one or the other. So we think of it kind of as a seesaw. Too much independence, they're unsafe. Too much control, they're not independent. There's tension between them because every teenager, of course, wants complete freedom or at least close to complete freedom. Uh, my favorite book, if you're looking for something to read about raising an adolescent, uh, I think I'm paraphrasing the title is Get Out of My Life, uh, but first, can you take Mary and me to the mall? So that, I think, sums up adolescence beautifully. But let's go back to this paradox. So when my middle son turned 17 some years ago, he was uh, finishing his junior year of high school, entering his senior year, wanted him to get a job for the summer, earn some money, learn what that was like. So he got a job at uh, Publix supermarket, if any of you know Publix. He was a, what they called a front end attendant there. You put your bag, uh, your groceries in the bag and carried it out to the car. Um, <clears throat> he also got his driver's license because that was the, mar the magic age here in Georgia. And he had his first serious girlfriend. So you can see this was a big summer for my son, Jason. And <clears throat> To manage the polarity here, the paradox, we wanted him to use this summer to work on his independence, but you don't let go of that other pole. So we, he had a curfew, we kept an eye on him, but our focus was more on the independence, especially when it came to money. So we knew all the variables, how much he was gonna earn that summer. I sat down with Jason at the beginning of the summer and said, hey buddy, uh, you need a goal, how much are you gonna save? Uh, that way you can kind of measure it. And he's the exuberant topping. He goes, I want to save $600, Dad. So that's a good goal, Jason. Go do it. So we set up a bank account, <clears throat> linked it to mine so I could watch his balance every second if I wanted to and see if he could save his $600. Now, I'm not claiming this was great parenting, folks, but I didn't say a word to him all summer. I mean, I could have made sure he saved $600 by nagging him, but that wouldn't have taught him anything. So... I didn't say a word. I mean, you might want to guess how much he actually saved by the end of the summer. When I asked that question in class, the pessimists say zero, and the optimists say $700. In this case, the pessimists won. He saved $60, six zero, one-tenth of his goal. Now, one of Jason's burdens in life is having a professor for a father. So at the end of the summer, we sat down and we had a debrief. <clears throat> and I brought his younger brother along to uh, kind of learn the lessons so maybe he could uh, climb that curve a little faster. I believe this is a direct quote. Jason turned to his brother and said, here's what I learned. Don't get a girlfriend, they'll spend all your money. So that was kind of ancillary learning. My point being that the risk of his not saving $600 was worth what he learned, the lessons of independence, because, because you earn the money doesn't mean you save it. And it has helped him in his life. Now, this did not happen during the summer, but it might have. What if I had gotten a call two o'clock one Sunday morning 
Professor Topping, this is the DeKalb County Police Department. We've arrested your son driving under the influence on a DUI. Well, my polarity just sank. I was on the upside of the independence poll, and now the negative consequences of too much independence have really come into play. And that's a pretty serious problem. As Barry Johnson would say, when you've gone to the negative consequences, the negative side of a poll, you have to pull from the opposite pole to do the rebalancing. Take away the keys, lock them in a closet, whatever I could do, I try to keep them safe. Well, if I did that for three years, then he wouldn't be working well on his independence. The point being that when you're looking at a paradox, even if you're on the benefit side of one of the poles, Johnson would say, <clears throat> gravity will pull you down. A groove becomes a rut, and it's time to rebalance. If you wait too long, the rebalancing can be very painful. And that's what we tend to do in organizations. We don't manage the creative tension, these paradoxes, very well, and then it gets to be a serious problem, and we have to do some dramatic change, which is basically the pendulum swinging from one side to the other. So here's a classic polarity that any organization of any size faces. I think you've heard the expression, think global, act local. We could change the words, decentralized, centralized. Large companies are not either decentralized or centralized. They're both decentralized and centralized. There's a headquarters and there's the field. There's an interdependence. The more centralized we operate, the less decentralized and vice versa. There is tension between those two. Headquarters wonders why the field won't listen to what they're told to do. And the field wonders why headquarters doesn't have a clue what happens in the field. We'll never solve that problem. That tension always exists. So if we map it out as a polarity, and I've filled in some of the words here, you think about what are the benefits of being a highly decentralized, a highly local organization? You can move fast, you're more flexible. It feels great in the field. You have power, decision-making responsibility. You're close to the customer. You can focus on what they need. What's the benefit of being more centralized or global? Well, you take benefit of the interdependencies among your units. <clears throat> you can integrate better across the disciplines. You take advantage of economies of scale. You have more consistency and more standardization. You have more shared learning in the organization. Both of those are good things. However, how do we manage the balance between them? Because an overly decentralized organization can be wasting an awful lot of resources and an overly centralized organization becomes bureaucratic and slow. Back about uh, 12 years ago, I got to know the Home Depot very well, working with them in executive education through the Nardelli era. And I had a lot of respect for Bob as a leader. Certainly some things uh, come to light that uh, uh, made it difficult for him to continue with that organization. But I'd say he had a lot of good qualities. And he saw this and realized that they were way too decentralized. In the Bernie Marcus, Arthur Blank era, and Bernie was the CEO and the founder of the company and would say to his store owners, this is your store, you own it. <clears throat> he didn't enable email from headquarters to the store. In fact, headquarters is still called today Store Support Center, which shows you the mindset of decentralized organization. Because he didn't want a store manager sitting behind their desk reading a bunch of corporate emails. He wanted them on the floor with associates and customers. But they had to communicate, so they communicated through hard copy inter-office mail. And he told his store managers, if you don't like it, don't do it. In fact, in California, I'm told he gave his store managers a stamp that said BS. If you get a memo from corporate, you don't like it, you stamp it BS and you send it back. I mean, can you imagine what it felt like to be a store manager? Very empowered, a very entrepreneurial mindset. And yet, as they grew, you can't maintain that. Right? The whole issue of consistency and standardization across stores 
if every store manager or district manager can set the store up their own way, it's very confusing to the customers. And certainly for brand equity, your brand is diluted the more that you have those kinds of inconsistencies. They were making merchandising decisions at the district level, purchasing from vendors eight to 10 stores at a time, rather than leveraging the 1,000, 1,200 stores for one purchase. They were leaving money on the table. So one of the first things Nardelli did was to centralize merchandising there. And those are hard things to do. And when you've let that go for a long time, that pendulum swings from side to side. And we go from overly decentralized to overly centralized. What is more effective is if we can balance those two more like this than like that. Instead of swinging from end to end, we should have an organization that is constantly assessing when our dilemmas, our paradoxes, our polarities are getting out of balance. And as leaders, you have to keep your head pretty close to the action. Be hands-on to understand when changes are needed in order to make that shift. Another classic polarity, stability and change. You're not either stable or changing. You need to be both stable and changing. An overly stable organization is complacent. It ain't broke, don't fix it. And so congratulations, you're no longer competitive. You're the low cost provider of a buggy whip. Nobody wants them anymore. If you have too much change, however, you've got chaos. People don't know what to do. They kind of get paralyzed in action or they take off and go in their own directions. We need a balance of the two. And in today's world, there's a lot more change than there is stability. So one of the challenges for leaders is how to bring that stability pull up higher? How do we give some stability to our organizations that are going through dramatic change? One of the ways are the values of the organization. If they're real, if we live to them, they don't change. They may adapt slightly, but they stay constant. And if I believe in the values of our organization, that gives me a sense of comfort and stability as an employee. Another form of stability is the manager, the leader the person I work with every day. If that individual is consistent and predictable in good times and bad, that helps me to feel more secure and more stable. I know how that person's gonna react. I know I can count on them when I need to. And so part of stability is us, each one of us, and our emotional intelligence and how well we manage our own uh, emotions and behaviors and skills on the organization. So we need to be able to manage the tension between these two things. Alfred North Whitehead wrote about this some decades ago. Um, <clears throat> I love the quote, the art of progress is to preserve order amid change and to preserve change amid order. So both and thinking, boy, we need more of it today. We need self-discipline and flexibility, give and take, specialization, and integration. <clears throat> we need diversity and commonality. We need ideas and dreams, and we need to value in the past. So we're gonna run a poll now and see if any of these particular kind of common universal polarities, paradoxes, whichever term you prefer, you're dealing with right now in your own organization. Which one is the most difficult? I'd like the voters to, uh, the participants please, go ahead and select <clears throat> Which one you think is the most profoundly challenging for you now? And then we'll tabulate our results. And here are the results. That's fairly consistent with what I hear. I think the stability, change, and quality, speed are two of the big ones today. Um, <clears throat> and now the question is, of course, what do you do about it? And that's where I'd like to kind of conclude our session. So am I on? Yeah, there we go. So I think it's collaboration that is important here. Um, in order to manage the both and, we have to work with folks where there is a difference between us and find a way to make that work in the organizational world. Collaboration is uh, one of the most popular words out there today. So again, uh, kind of looking up a def definition, Webster's online, 
calls it uh, how we work together, especially in some type of intellectual endeavor. Uh, here's one of my uh, kind of telling definitions. To cooperate or willingly assist an enemy of one's country, and especially an occupying force, kind of like the collaborateurs in France during World War II, or to cooperate with an agency in which one is not immediately connected. Why is that different from cooperation, which is operating together? I think because of this a very interesting kind of comment. You cooperate with your friends and you collaborate with the enemy. To me, cooperation is when two agendas are aligned, when we're both trying to do the same thing, when the objectives are the same, when our incentives and rewards are the same, we're measured the same way. Then it is easy to cooperate. Collaboration, on the other hand, is when our agendas are not aligned when the engineers are evaluated on the quality of their products, and yet the marketers and the sales folks are evaluated on speed to market and uh, you know, market size. And these two things are not the same. And therefore, we still have to find a way to work together when our agendas, our objectives are somewhat misaligned. And so the, how we set the groups up, the organizational design, how well we know ourselves in this process and how effectively we communicate with each other gives us an opportunity to better balance those polarities and interests that <clears throat> organizations and individuals find. Uh, there's a framework I've used, and I don't know if this would be of value to you, but I recommend you think through it, of uh, how do I get someone to collaborate with me when I don't have the power to command it? So the need to influence without authority is very important today, especially in both and thinking. And Cohen and Bradford developed this model that uh, I have found helpful. It, it doesn't really matter where you start in it. Uh, you do want to have the relationships built if you can. I think to me, the more telling kind of components here are number one, assume all our potential allies. We don't collaborate well in organizations when our agendas and our objectives are misaligned. And then we tend to blame the others for the failings that we're having. And yet, <clears throat> we should be collaborating. If our default function is, if there's a way I can help you, if there's a way I can help you meet your objectives, I should do that. Rather than, I'm focused only on mine, and if I can get to yours, maybe I will. So the assumption that all our allies sets a mindset that collaboration can occur. And then we start to clarify what are the goals and priorities. And I need to understand your world better and understand what's important to you. And then identify how you're measured. So that, no, that next most important bubble to me is the identify relevant currencies, theirs and yours. I mean, we're all talking perhaps US dollars. That's not the currency I'm referring to. It's the metric, how we're measured. And when they're different, it's gonna, affect the way we act together, the way we collaborate. And we're going to need to have some give and take in order to make it work. And both of us are going to need to try to come out with a win-win solution here. So what gets in the way of this type of collaboration? In many organizations, there are so many barriers. And that's the role of the leader, <clears throat> excuse me, to try to minimize those barriers, get them out of the way, and to help people work collaboratively across the board. If we use rank and job title, if we're a credential driven organization, if you're not an executive, you don't get to talk to me. We're not gonna collaborate. If we don't trust information from others, if there is a sense of quote, stranger danger, we're not gonna collaborate because collaboration requires shared information. And if I view power as a zero sum game, the more you get, the less for me. And in today's world, I'm going to hoard power because I'm going to hoard knowledge, excuse me, because in that way, I'm in control of that information. And if I don't share it with you, I know stuff you don't know. Therefore, we're not collaborating and I'm the one in control. To collaborate, we have to share that information and realize that power is expandable. The more you get, there may be more for me. And then finally, we have to drop the, we didn't come up with the idea. So therefore, it's not a good idea. 
What does a non-collaborative leader look like? It's one that wears their functional hat, not their enterprise hat all the time. Black and white. This is what my group needs. This is what finance needs. This is what marketing needs. Yes, we do need to have that. And we need to look at what the enterprise needs. This is the universal polarity of part and whole. We deal with that all the time. You're an individual and a team. That's the part, that's the whole. You're a team and a unit. You're a unit in a division. You're a division in an enterprise. And so we need to be able to wear both hats. The competition is outside the organization, folks, not inside. Except in so many companies, we waste so much energy fighting with each other because of these competing agendas and this inability to collaborate because we're black and white thinkers. And then I lose patience. I demand quick results. Complex issues don't get resolved quickly. And I love to win. I don't care if you lose. And so even if it is not in the best interest of the customer, I need to feed my ego and win. And conflict is dysfunctional. So I'm going to avoid it or I'm going to dominate it. And then I'm going to tell you that that's not how we do things around here. It's not consistent with the culture. These are all non-collaborative behaviors and mindsets. So on the other side of the coin, to try to kind of close up our session for today, I encourage you to try to be a more collaborative leader. Lead with questions, not answers. You can guide a conversation. You can move people in the direction you want to move them very effectively with questions if you think it through. And let them come up with the answers under your guidance. That's collaboration. We also need to make sure we understand the other party. We make too many assumptions. We jump to conclusions too quickly. In both and thinking, you need to seek first to understand. And then create that environment where you're sharing power with your associates. See what kind of ideas bubble up so we can balance those different priorities. And if we're effective doing it, the whole is definitely greater than the sum of its parts. And the collaborative leader sees it that way. And finally, let me conclude by a quote from uh, Peter Senge, the faculty member at MIT who was a part of kind of creating the learning organization concept some years ago. And he would say, have less discussions and more dialogue. And talking about that, the word discussion has the same roots as the words percussion and concussion, meaning that <clears throat> we're going to beat each other over the head with our ideas. We're not listening very well, and we're whacking each other. <clears throat> That's not going to get us very far. So dialogue has the roots, dialogue, through conversation, through conversation, we might understand each other better, find a way to collaborate, and balance the, uh, the difference, the tension between these interdependent ideas. That will help us in an organization. So whether it's speed, equality, stability, or change, whichever paradox you're dealing with, realizing those are two-dimensional in a multi-dimensional world, you can use that polarity map to communicate with someone how we need to readjust our balance because we're out of balance. Do it early, don't wait too long. And this to me is a very important leadership competency today. So thank you for that. And I'll be glad to take any questions or comments while we have some time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. This has been a really uh, interesting, engaging discussion. Uh, I think uh, I'm really going to uh, walk away that last point about discussion versus dialogue. I've never heard it uh, presented in that way. I think it's a really valuable takeaway for all of us, uh, just the, root, the roots of the word and how that can translate to how it manifests uh, in the real world um, as we uh, work with one another. Um, I do have some questions that start to come in. Everyone, please start sending your questions uh, now. Um, the first question I'll pose comes from Kathleen. And she's asking, uh, referring back to the polarity map that you used, and she found it very helpful. And she wants to understand uh, what is your experience with how organizations use the outcome to define the direction or actions they will take? It's a wonderful team exercise, Kathleen, if you uh, can get people to be candid. And you ask them to take whatever paradox you're working on and kind of write the words that go into all of those four quadrants and then try to collectively decide where is the organization today. And many times they're on one side of the pole, negative consequences of too much. 
uh, I was working with a financial services firm that was uh, born as a community bank with big bank resources. So all the people who were in the senior team uh, fled the big bank world to because they really wanted to be in a more of a community banking environment, but they knew how the large banks worked and they were affiliated with a large bank to have the resources, but they wanted to uh, help their customers through the community banking mindset. Of course, it was wildly successful, which meant they got bigger. And as they got bigger, they started acting more like the big bank. And by going through this process as a team, they realized they had gotten out of balance and they needed to come up with a way to do some strategies, not to let go of some of those centralization issues, but to recover some of that community banking feel. And it made a big difference for them. So if you get a team to be candid and really talk about the issues, this becomes that map can become a very good vehicle for change. Great, thank you. I think that provides a great segue into next question, uh, just about getting your team to be candid to foster this better ability. Um, from Tim, Tim's wondering about what characteristics do you see in organizations that are actually effective uh, collaborators and are good at balancing a change and consistency? I don't think there's a, a secret to it, but it really is hard. And it's gotta be role modeled all the way through the organization. I have found that the senior team of a company or an organization um, is the most important component to look at in trying to help build a collaborative culture. I don't know about you, Tim, but I've been in companies working with them where two members of the senior team are at war with each other. When that happens, the people who report to them through the chain of command are even at more at war with the other party to try to prove their value to their boss. And it's a mess. And so they have collaboration and teamwork as a value on all the business cards and on all the posters around the building. But there's no collaboration and teamwork at the senior team. When that happens, it's very hard to cascade that down the organization. Now, we can't wait for a senior team to become collaborative if they're not. So you do want to try to role model that as a leader of a team yourself or even as a member of a team. But it is most important that it starts at the top and that filters down through the organization. It is a deliberate act to create a collaborative culture. Okay, great. Uh, then speaking uh, more specific to the individuals within the environment, you've given us the um, comparison between the leadership versus we'll call the subordinates, the regular employees. Um, now, more so in terms of the intermingling of people, uh, how do you encourage, this is coming from uh, Dr. Diana, Brad, uh, Dr. Uh, Bradley, uh, she'd like to understand uh, what advice can you offer in encouraging the different generations in the workplace to collaborate since work values may differ from generation to generation? Uh, of course, it, that's a great topic, a great question, um, a challenge. And, and yet at the same time, it, it is what should help an organization thrive. Um, we can't afford to have one dimensional perspective. And so working across generations has always been a challenge in organizations. There have been multiple generations uh, in organizations, certainly all through the 20th and now in the 21st century. And yet I think it's exacerbated today, one by the speed of change in the generations um, and by the size of the groups. So mostly we're talking, I guess, about the baby boomer generation of which I'm a member and the millennial generation, which is the echo boomers, our kids, if you will, we're the two largest blocks in the workforce. And the generation Xers are squeezed in between us. So we have got to find a way to work all those together. And the generations that are closest to each other, kind of like Darwin's principle, the more like the members of the species, the more intense the competition. So the generations that are closest usually have the more conflict. So millennials and Gen Xers have some tension between them. And, and of course, they need each other. But I think the baby boomers are the key here. As we're leaving organizations, some of us now, and getting a little closer to retirement, our legacy can be to help get the millennials up to speed, climbing the learning curve. We're going to need them to be in leadership positions earlier than we started mainly because Generation X is such a small generation, they're half the size, that there aren't gonna be enough of them to fill up all the leadership roles we need to fill as boomers retire. 
So I think you work across generations. We have a better chance of skipping a generation as a kind of a coaching mentoring relationship. And that will help, I think, bridge the gaps in all organizations. So I encourage people to look at those kinds of mentoring relationships. Then speaking more so to interpersonal uh, relations, uh, MJ is wondering uh, what's the best way to influence a team member who wants to dominate decisions? Um, <laughs> I wish I had a simple answer for that. Um, it depends, of course, on so much of the situation as to where the real power lies. If the dominant player is also the manager, it's much harder than if the dominant player is one of the team members. Uh, a polarity map can help if you can show kind of the both and part of it, but mostly you have to find a way to get that person to listen. And that may need somebody else to carry that message if your voice isn't being heard. So one of the things we work on uh, as a coach, uh, either someone who is dominant or someone who is working with a dominant character, is how to find the right avenue of getting that person to have a little more self-awareness. You can't give self-awareness to someone who has none, but you can enhance self-awareness to someone who has a little bit if you find the right voice. So I'm not sure it's an issue of paradox as much as it is an issue of personality, of finding who has influence over this individual and help them learn that they can learn more by listening than by talking. I hope that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Uh, coming from Sarah, uh, getting back to the earlier discussion regarding uh, the polarity map and how many companies have more of a dichotomous uh, view of how to operate, uh, Sarah's wondering how can you work with companies that focus on don't do this, uh, sorry, uh, don't do this, don't do that, I guess essentially negating every, every option. If that's the culture of the company, there's very little one can really do as an individual player if you weigh down the chain. Um, you can do it in your own unit and try to show how that works. Uh, but if that's a dominant culture, uh, cultures are very hard to change. And, and I'm sorry to say this, but my best advice is you want to find a company with a different culture if you're more collaborative. However, if that's a dominant culture in a unit, but not the whole organization, then you want to try to share best practices as best you can. So the, that's not how we think around here. That's not how we do things around here. That is a, a, a formula for disaster. And perhaps showing them case studies of companies that have felt that way before. Uh, a good one to show is the, uh, the case about Xerox and Canon back from some decades ago when Xerox had over 90% of the share of office copying machines, photocopiers, before Canon ever really entered the market. And then over a three to five year period, Canon um, accumulated about 60% market share. That's a dramatic drop for Xerox in a short period of time. And somebody did a uh, analysis of the minutes of the board of directors meetings of the two companies. And in the Xerox case, at all the board of director meetings, there never was mention of the word Canon through that whole five year period. They never talked about it. And at Canon, in the minutes of the board meetings, the word Xerox came up at every meeting. Because of course the board there was, how can we beat Xerox? And so if you can show people some of that information from a kind of a, a company that's not a part of them, that they don't feel as attacked, maybe that'll help them realize that they better open themselves up to some different perspectives. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, coming in. Oh, sorry. I think I... Uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, looking from the outside in, uh, we have a question from... Uh, Savita wondering, how do we know ahead of time if the culture of an organization encourages collaborative leadership where associates are respected uh, and encouraged to bring new ideas? I think you have to put on your sociologist and anthropologist hat, and it's not easy. You have to work at it. Um, but the signs are usually there. Um, so if you're going in to look at an organization, what I encourage you to go in person. Um, get a feel for the environment, how people are situated, what kinds of conversations you're hearing, um, how isolated folks tend to be, what are the common areas and how often are they used. 
Um, what are meeting rooms look like? Uh, what kinds of motivational posters or artwork do they have? Uh, what are the themes? Without saying a word, walk around and see if you can pick it up. It's surprisingly more often there than you would imagine. But we don't look for it because we're focused on our interview or where we're trying to get to. So it does, uh, you do have to open your eyes a bit. And then if you can, try to overhear some conversations. Not that you're eavesdropping, but just get a sense of the vocabulary. Is it we? Is it I? Is it us? Is it them? Um, it, are people working together to try to solve a common problem? Do they walk around? Uh, I've been in four different universities, and you can just tell by the way the, um, uh, the office doors are either open or closed as to how collaborative an environment is. So put on your anthropologist and sociologist hat and see if you can observe uh, what that culture kind of feels like to you. Your instincts are probably going to be accurate. Okay, great. So we'll take uh, just one last question. This is coming up from Prince. Uh, he's asking, uh, how do, does one identify progress within tradition? For example, you mentioned competition within organizations, uh, having a must-win attitude within the culture of the company. So right. I guess how would one measure progress against that, that tradition uh, changing in a more positive direction or different uh, direction? Perhaps that's an important uh, element to be looking at. And, and I may make this a little overly simplistic, forgive me. Um, I use the terms tradition and ritual. And as a leader, your challenge is to honor traditions and break rituals. Traditions are things that remind us where we came from. To know where we are as an organization today and where we're going, it is really helpful to look back at where we've come from. New people in organizations don't have that sense of history. And that's where the traditions really help. And so you do want to keep some of those alive. And uh, it connects us all to the past, the evolution of our organization. Rituals, on the other hand, are things that we do and we keep doing, but we no longer really even know why. It's the classic when you ask somebody, so why do you do it that way? Because we've always done it that way. Well, if always doing it that way means it's still the best way to do it, fine. But shouldn't we at least look at it, challenge it, see if there's a better way to do it? Because the rituals really are reflective of, I'm comfortable doing it this way, and this is how I'm going to keep doing it. So take your nose out of my business. Thank you very much. Those are the things you want to try to break. So you want to make progress and you want to honor where you've come from. Those are important. It's a paradox to try to manage. I really thank you for asking that important question. All right, great. Thank you. So I think we'll end on that note with a wonderful uh, question and response. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, everyone who attended this webinar today. As I shared, we will be sending you a recording and a replay um, for you to watch this uh, later and digest all the great information that was shared. Um, and at this uh, point, I'd just like to turn it uh, back to you, Peter, for any final words or for the audience. Well, I want to thank you all for attending. I hope it was helpful. Um, this is such an important quality today in our personal as well as our professional lives. So I wish you well with it. And I hope you'll pick up some of those books that I mentioned. They're really worth reading. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you. I'm the Exec and Goizueta Business School. And I'll take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us.